Да, я скажу. Окей. Good evening, dear friends. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> uh, actually, today we have the last literary event of this year. Uh, since um, the spring, we have here Russian-American bilingual, basically, uh, literary readings. And uh, I'm very happy that today our guest is uh, Maxim Schreier, who we also know for years, because the first time we organized your event like 10 years ago, or maybe more, maybe more. In JCC with your father, it was like 2004, probably, five, something like that. Yeah, and I'm very happy to see you here again. Um, so probably all of you, you know Maxim. Uh, and I just want to say a few words that uh, Maxim Schreier, uh, he is professor of Russian and English and Jewish studies in Boston College. Uh, he is also um, author of a um, number of books, Waiting for America and Living Russia, and story collection, Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, uh, and his new book of fiction, Russian immigrants, three novellas, uh, explores the lives of immigrants from Russia um, at Boston College, um, uh, in the former uh, Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, he is a winner of 2007 National Jewish Book Award, uh, 2012 Guggenheim Fellow, and he directs the project of Russian and Eurasian uh, Jewry at Harvard's David Center for Russian Eura Eurasian Studies. Um, uh, I'm happy here to see Pavel Limbersky, who actually um, recently uh, also performed his literature, I would say, because he is a performer, great performer. And I will read a quote from you about Maxim. Uh, a Russian immigrant is a loving for a well to things past and disintegrated. As a sensitive, intelligent, and compassionate young Simon Reznikov, who never misses the chance to assert his Russian American biculturalism and his Jewishness, or follow his heart uh, in pursuit of romantic love is a joy to observe as he moves from adolescence to early adulthood. Schreier's protagonist is bound to take pride of place among other renowned characters of coming-of-age fiction and beyond. And another writer, Ellen Pollock, say that if you want the honest, beautifully rendered, and deeply compelling truth about what it's like to be a Russian immigrant in America, these three braided novellas by very talented Maxim Schreier, Schreier are all you need. Maxim, please. Good evening. It's very nice to see you all. Thank you so much, Regina, for your kind introduction. Thank you for coming. And. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, to be part of this series again. It's a wonderful undertaking. We Bostonians uh, don't get to speak in New York very often, so it's a special treat. And um, so I'm speaking about this uh, new book, A Russian Immigrant, Three Novellas, which came out uh, in September. And as Regina already, as Regina already pointed out it's a book of fiction about Russian immigrants in America. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the book, and then with your permission I'll read from a little, little excerpts from each of the novellas. Uh, so as you know, there are perhaps as many as a million Russian Americans living in this country. Yeah? So mm, is this a lot or not? Uh, it really is a delicate uh, calculation. It depends how you know you think 
of uh, the way we Russian Americans, and the majority of us came here, of course, on the wings of the great Jewish immigration, of the way we sort of manifest our presence in the mainstream. On the one hand, of course, you can take, uh, right, the Jewish boy from Moscow who invented Google, right, uh, and uh, I think uh, just about every person in North America is uh, aware of that person. But on the other hand, there is still a greater anonymity to the lives of uh, Russian Americans here. And uh, it's precisely that uh, condition which I would define as a combination of tremendous socioeconomic success and uh, sort of uh, residual, el residual alienation that interests me in these novellas. Uh, because this, this is not a sociological study, it's, uh, uh, it's a work of fiction. And uh, again, uh, I feel like in her very short introduction, Regina said it all, but let me just repeat that uh, um, the protagonist of these three novellas, his name is Simeon Reznikov. In Russia, he used to be, uh, he's Simon here, he used to be Simeon. When he came here, his uh, name, his first name was transliterated S-E-M-E-N, so he immediately felt like it's time to change it, so he became Simon. And Simon has been here for almost as long as his, as his creator has, but unlike his creator, he's still restless. Uh, and this restlessness drives him uh, mainly to travel, and his travels, in a sense, define his identity, because he travels to various places which enables him simultaneously to feel closer to Russia, but also feel how much he's changed, and the extent to which America is now his home. In the book, he travels uh, to Bohemia, to the Czech lands. He also travels extensively in America, and particularly in New England, which is his home. Uh, it's also my home for 33 years. Now, um, I want to tell you a little bit about how this book came about. Uh, and it's, uh, believe me when I say to you that I almost gave up on this book. Uh, so around 1998, it's kind of an interesting time in my life. So. I had tenure, I had, I think, published already uh, several books. I hadn't yet met my wife, uh, my children hadn't been born, so I felt, I felt both relaxed and I suppose to some degree rest, restless the way Simon feels in the book. So um, I had already been writing quite a bit of short fiction in English, but I was thinking of a longer form. So I wrote three novellas. The idea always was that they would be interconnected. And somehow I wrote them and they didn't feel right. They didn't hang together well. And uh, I abandoned them. And uh, several of you here know me. I'm not the kind of person who generally abandons writing projects. And I always insist that people should finish them. And in fact, I have a younger daughter, Tatiana, who is a poet. She recently won a book prize. She has a poetry book that will be published. And basically, the struggle with her is she writes very quickly. And then I feel like she doesn't like to work on them and polish them. So I always say, you know, you need to, you need to really work on the rewriting. And I couldn't convince myself back in 98 that the book was somehow any way to be rewritten. I abandoned it. Years went by, imagine. And it kept, it kept gnawing on me. I, it really kept gnawing on me that I had this manuscript. So two years ago, I, I no longer had it typewritten because, I mean, word processed because the technology had changed so much. I had a printout. I read it. And I immediately knew that one of the novellas had to be completely discarded, and then about one half of uh, what eventually became the middle novella had to be discarded. And so uh, I ended up writing another half of the manuscript. Uh, and I also knew right away that, in a sense, the secret to how to tell my stories of Russian immigrants is that we are creatures who live in fragments. Immigrants in general live in fragments, but particularly I think Russian immigrants have fragments and pockets. So the book is told both linearly and non-linearly. It is told with quite a bit of suspense, and uh, there is even, uh, there's even crime and murder in it. Uh, but all of these things work in such a way that only toward the very end of the third novella do you actually figure out the immigrant beginnings of the main character. So in a sense, toward the very end of the book, you find yourself uh, linearly 
at the very beginnings of this immigrant's path. This is not to say that there aren't digressions that take you back to Russia or to Estonia where the protagonist spent his childhood, but the immigrant story is told very much against, uh, against sort of linear vectors. Uh, the, and so basically it uh, somehow all fell together after that. Uh, now, I also want to tell you a couple of other things. Uh, sort of, what was I trying to do? My sense was that uh, to tell the story of Russian immigrants in America, one also somehow needs to account for two things. One is, of course, we all came here with uh, some material baggage. When we came here in 1987, we had four suitcases and then two typewriters. My father had a typewriter and I had a typewriter. In fact, I'm just working now on a piece uh, which deals with these typewriters, and I had to research uh, my father's typewriter, which is uh, an Olympia from about 1937, a German typewriter, which he bought secondhand uh, uh, in the middle of medical school when he was uh, in need of typing more of his poems up uh, with the purpose of submission. But in any case, so we had those. And then the process of acculturation and assimilation to I think is about a gradual disposal of the material baggage, but it's also about a certain tension where you hold on to the immaterial baggage, the baggage of memory, but you also, I think, experience pressure to dispose of that baggage as well. It's, in a sense, a zero sum. So what the characters in this book are struggling with or against is this pressure to hold on to some of the Russian, Soviet, Jewish, material baggage of memory, and yet to expand their selves, their identities. And uh, it sometimes works out harmoniously, at other times is a source of tremendous frustration. Um, two more observations. One, so the cover. How did the cover come about? I actually did a little assessment uh, this fall because I've been reading from this book, and I looked at various covers of my books. And I concluded something very peculiar. So most of the uh, literary books of mine that came out in this country had uh, cover art uh, that uh, was based on the photographs I snapped. I'm no photographer, but I like to snap pictures. But the publishers were very agreeable. However, every single book of mine that's come out in translation, in Russia, in Italy, in China, I've had uh, books published in a bunch of countries, they all had artwork that the publisher chose practically without consultation with me. So I feel very happy that this photograph, uh, this cover is based on a picture I snapped uh, about a year ago. So the book was already in production, uh, in copy editing, I think. I went out to a little neighborhood park in Brookline where I live, uh, which is a, a western suburb of uh, Boston. It's basically Boston. The park is surrounded by very old weeping willows. Somehow the leaves had fallen overnight and the grounds was strewn with these perfect silver leaves of weeping willows. Uh, I started snapping pictures, but what you don't know is that the actual photograph is uh, much larger, it's horizontal. And somewhere here in the photograph, there sat a man with a very, very old Newfoundland dog. The dog was so old that it literally was just lying, sitting at his feet. And I thought to myself, this man came here from Russia, and the dog was a puppy. And he's been here so long that the dog is now a very old dog. I thought that to myself, but I hesitated to ask. Then, as the book was being copy edited, I edited a section, a little section, where in the middle novella, the main character and uh, his old flame are having a reunion and they're taking a walk around the lake and they see a man with a very old dog and he says to her he must be a Russian and she says no Polish. Uh, honestly I don't know how this all happened but basically the picture, the larger picture has that dog and that man which now lives in the story. Uh, so with that in mind uh, if you, I'd like to read a little bit from each of the novellas uh, uh, the first novella is called Bohemian Spring, and the section I'll read is towards the end of the novella. In Bohemian Spring, Simon ends up going to Prague to collect material for 
uh, a book that he hopes to write, which is a biography of this uh, Jewish Czech writer who is very well known, except very little known is known about his life. In other words, he became his text, uh, to paraphrase uh, the famous poem. He became his admirers, he became his text. Uh, and so Simon is researching his biography while also trying to figure out how far he has moved away from his Russian roots. And he meets a Czech woman, things become serious, and he's uh, contemplating uh, something which I'm going to read to you about. So that's from Bohemian Spring. And Bohemian Spring, of course, is a fairly obvious but necessary pun on both Bohemian as in Bohemian lands, as sort of the core Czech lands, and Bohemian as in the life of artists, right? Uh, and uh, that's uh, the section that I'd like to read. Here we go. Walking from Clementinum towards the Charles Bridge, Simon thought of how soothing it felt to be an anonymous person in a seething city crowd. His plane was leaving Saturday morning, and Friday was their last day together in Prague. His original plan had been to do some souvenir shopping and find a present for his mother, perhaps a locally made scarf or shawl, or a pair of earrings with Czech garnets. Instead, without fully knowing what he was doing, he hopped on the tram. From his stop, he ran up the hill all the way to Vitek and Irenka's house. I will digress and explain that Vitek is an old 19, vintage 1968 Czech dissident who now, after the Velvet Revolution, rents rooms to visiting American and Canadian uh, scholars, writers, journalists, and so Simon is staying in that house. Uh, so from his stop, he ran up the hill all the way to Vitek and Irenka's house, he borrowed Vitek's portable console, its slatened body reminding him of his own father's old typewriter. Kneeling in front, of the own, uh, in front of the only chair in his room, Simon machine gunned the text of an invitation. Simon Riesnikov, 516 Whitney Avenue, apartment two, New Haven, Connecticut. The US consulate, Prague, Czech Republic. It is my pleasure to invite Ms. Milena Krupichkova, citizen of, the, of Czechoslovakia, to visit me in the United States of America during June, August 1993. Ms. Krupichkova is a close friend of mine, and the purpose of her visit will be tourism. Throughout the duration of Ms. Krupichkova's stay in the United States, I will take care of her accommodations and, if not necessary, provide her with financial and health care assistance. I am a US, U.S. citizen and would be grateful if the U.S. consulate acted favorably and promptly on Ms. Krupichkova's request for a U.S. visa. Sincerely, Simon Reznikov. He released the guide and rotated the platen knob clockwise until most of the sheet was out of the typewriter's grip. He then proofread the invitation, rotated the knob in the opposite direction, and typed the letter over the word Czechoslovakia, crossing it out as well as he could. And in the text, it is truly crossed out, as you will see. Crossing it out as well as he could, he rotated the knob just a touch and typed the Czech Republic above the blacked out name of the country which the land of his birth caressed with tanks and jack boots in 1968 just as he was learning to walk in the streets of Moscow. He smiled like a blind jazz pianist, rolled the page off the platen, folded it, and placed it in an airmail envelope. It was the only envelope he had in his room, and he wrote Milena Krupichkova Prague on it, thinking of the lonesome boy in Chekhov's story who inscribed the envelope with the tremulous words to grandpas at the village. Taking some money from a stash he kept in his toiletry kit, Simon headed down to the tram stop. He bought a bunch of waxy tulips from a flower girl. Should I just 
Ask Milena to marry me right here on the spot, Simon thought, as he walked past the interchangeable hippies strumming their guitars on the bridge. Just take my grandmother's old ring off my pinky and give it to her, he reasoned with an imaginable double who was called Sioma. For some reason, Simon was convinced that Milena would say yes, but his Russian double was he. Also, sure, when Simon and Milena came out of the bar holding glasses of white wine, Simon noticed Frantic, Milena's ex-boyfriend, watching them from a bookshop across the street. By the time they had found two empty chairs on the sidewalk and pulled them together, the jealous musician was gone. Silently, they sipped their wine the rims of their hands joining and coming apart like blades of grass in the wind. Breaking the silence, Simon asked Milena, I wanted to ask you something. Ask me, Milena said, lowering her angled chin onto her left shoulder. Would you like to come and stay with me this summer in America? Yes, in America, in New Haven to be precise, but first, you would fly to New York. The Kennedy Airport, like in spy novels, Milena asked, exactly. And then we'll drive to New Haven and I'll take you around and show you New England. We can visit my folks in Boston, see Cape Cod in the ocean, there's lots to do. Will you have time for me? Simon hesitated, then reached for his breast pocket and removed the airmail envelope he had prepared for her. I didn't have another one, he said. This is for me? Milena asked. I've typed up an invitation. You'll need to take it to the American Embassy in Prague. Here, open it. Milena slowly read the invitation, her lips mouthing some of the words. She blushed, then composed herself and said, trying to find the right English words, Simon, you surprise me. May I please think about it? They crossed to the other side holding hands. The Voltava, swollen with the spring torrents, carried urban detritus under the arches of the bridge. There are 16 of them, Simon remembered Milena telling him the first time they walked together across the Charles Bridge, yelping and thrashing. A Maltese was trying to rip its leash from the hands of its owner, an old lady wearing a mauve hat with flowers. Small dogs, big tempers, Simon wanted to quote one of his father's aphorisms, but hesitated. He thought of his parents in Boston, of the daily Russian phone calls, and he felt a double pang of sadness, which Russian immigrants sometimes feel when traveling in Europe. At the circle near Malastranska Square, he offered to walk Milena to her car. I'm meeting my girlfriend, Agata. I'll drop her off and then drive home, Milena said a bit vaguely. Are you sure, he asked. There's your tram, go. I'll pick you up at the house at 10 in the morning. I love you, Milena, he yelled through the tram's closing doors. Uh, and uh, as you can well imagine, because otherwise uh, there wouldn't be much left to tell, uh, Milena never applies for that, uh, for that uh, visa to America, but it does open up some possibilities for Simon. And uh, that brings me to the second novella from which I'll read now. It's the middle novella. Uh, it's called Brotherly Love. Uh, and uh, the middle novella is the one probably most invested in Simon's uh, Russian Soviet past. And I'll read from the opening. There's really not much to explain, except, uh, except that uh, this is the prelude of uh, a reunion with the past, uh, which ends uh, really uh, violently, not for Simon, but for the woman he is about to meet, because uh, a certain specter of her Soviet, Russian and Jewish past uh, is going to come and uh, try to basically uh, vent out his uh, tremendous frustration with the unsuccessful immigrant he has become. But this is the beginning where really not a whole lot 
uh, I think threatens uh, threatens uh, the uh, reunion. Brotherly love. From his Soviet youth, Simon Reznikov missed camaraderie the most. He had been in America for nearly nine years, and yet his best male friends were still living in the old country. He had made new friends in college and graduate school, but it, was, it just wasn't the same. In Russia, they were like brothers to one another. They cared about each other no less passionately than they did about the girls they loved. How they admired one another's youthful wit and abandon, it was nearly impossible to explain to an American. This male friendship, this bond, brotherly love. They showed affection for each other through hugging and patting, even kissing. It would never occur to them back in the days of Soviet innocence and Puritanism that bodily contacts were anything but expressions of brotherly love. After living in America for some time, Simon the immigrant had begun to cultivate an image of himself and his old Soviet friends as something of a cross between Arthurian knights and lion cubs. All this had everything and nothing to do with an email Simon received in April 1996. He had just defended his dissertation and was waiting to hear from the colleges he had interviewed with about teaching jobs. The email came on a Friday morning, April 12th, the old Soviet day of cosmonautics. It displayed an economy of words. I have moved to con, a systems admin job. The rest, when I see you, A.M. The initials A.M. stood for Alexandra Mironova, or Sashenka, as everybody called her back in Moscow. Simon telephoned Sashenka on the evening of the day of cosmonautics. Two days later, on a sunny Saturday morning, he drove from New Haven to see her. Route 91 was empty all the way to the outskirts of Hartford. Twice, Simon listened to Because You Love Me by Celine Dion on different stations, singing along and keeping rhythm with his left hand when he wasn't singing along or reading the rural landscape, he left his memory ebb and flow. Fate itself was taking him to a rendezvous with the past. Simon had met Sashenka in the summer of 1986. He was 19, a rising third year university student majoring in philology and had just returned from a seven week research trip to the deep south of Russia. During this folklore collecting expedition, a group of them traveled in a ramshackle bus from one Russian village to another, recording old people's stories and songs. They slept in tents and cooked their own meals. There were 15 in the group, including two faculty members, a married graduate student and a driver, so there was little chance of romance. And they never stayed in any given place for more than two or three nights, which didn't leave much time to court the local collective farm bells. By the end of the trip, Simon had grown his first beard curlier and lighter than his hair. His skin felt like the outside of an old sheepskin coat, layers of dust, salt, and sun. Simon returned to Moscow at the end of July after collecting his pay for the expedition work, which came to almost 120 rubles, three times the monthly stipend he received at the university. Simon felt rich and grown up. A few days later, he and his parents took a night express train for Estonia. Like most of his friends in Moscow, Simon was still living at home with parents, and Estonia had for many years been the annual destination of their summer escape. That summer, between his second 
and third university years. Simon, for the first time, didn't share a seaside apartment with his mother and father, but roomed with three of his best friends who had rented a cottage and were already in Estonia waiting for him to join them. And so when Simon arrives to uh, Pjarna, which is the resort where he had been uh, going on vacation with his family for many, many years, uh, he is surprised to discover that uh, in the group of friends who had been going there since they were kids and who were all without exception either Jews or children of mixed Jewish Slavic marriages, there is a new person who is uh, a young woman from a Russian family and in fact uh, from the kind of Russian family where the grandma always told her to marry a Jewish man not because uh, Jews make uh, wonderful people but because uh, they make wonderful husbands and so she does end up uh, uh, she does end up first uh, getting involved with Simon and he with her uh, he uh, uh, leaves, emigrates after years of being a refusing. She, as he later finds out, as he later reconstructs, which is about to happen, as he's driving to meet with Sashenka, he's basically remembering their first summer together, his last in Russia, and when he meets her, basically he finally pieces together how it happened that she ended up marrying his uh, one of his best friends. Uh, um, and uh, you'll have to you'll have to read a little more to find out. But uh, there's going to be a bit of a change of tone, and I'm going to read something, I suppose, in a lighter mode. Uh, if there is a lighter mode in this book, I think there is. So I'll read from the third novella, which is called Borscht Belt. Now, uh, you probably know that Borscht Belt refers to an area in the Catskills, right, where uh, there used to be many, many larger and smaller Jewish resorts, uh, some of them uh, for very Orthodox Jews, others for very, very left-wing uh, Yiddish-speaking Jews, a whole spectrum of Jewry, and that uh, by the 1960s they started coming into a decline and disrepair, and then uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, some uh, uh, dashing entrepreneurs from our uh, diaspora attempted to resuscitate uh, uh, a couple of those uh, and basically the situation is that this is Simon's first summer in America. He's working a million jobs, uh, his parents are new immigrants, so he really has no summer plans. And then all of a sudden he discovers that, well it's very strange that in Soviet Union he had always gone on long vacations and he has no plans whatsoever and uh, they're all kind of lost, they're living in a small New England town and uh, Cape Cod seems just too pricey and somehow too uh, waspy and uh, through a friend he finds out about a resort called Bluebell Inn which is in the former Borscht Belt in the Catskills and he ends up going there for two weeks uh, but not alone. The arrangement that his family makes with another family is that he takes two grandmothers there and serves as their chaperone and so he arrives there um, really having not interacted with uh, Russian-speaking Jews for about a year to discover that there's a whole microcosm there. Most of these people had already been in America for 10 years. They were holding tight to the $20,000 they were making, right? Uh, most of them wanted to fight uh, Israel's battles without ever going to Israel. And uh, uh, Simon is uh, kind of shocked, pleased, surprised. And uh, one thing lead, uh, leads to another and he finds himself uh, embroiled in a uh, triangle that uh, uh, the more he tries to get out of it, the more it augurs, the more it spells disaster. So I'm going to read uh, a section uh, which has to do with a certain immortal lady who becomes uh, Simon's companion and from whose arms he has trouble uh, liberating himself. Uh, so basically, oh yeah, and there's not a whole lot to explain except there's one small sort of footnote which is not a real footnote in the text, but uh, uh, the name of uh, a great Russian poet will come up in conversation. You should know, or some of you do know, that uh, Mayakovsky uh, at one point uh, when he visited America spent a little time in a Jewish camp, not in the uh, Borscht Belt, not in the Catskills 
but in the Hudson Valley. And he wrote a poem about it called Camp Nidgedaita, which means camp don't fret. And oddly enough, uh, some of us actually read it in school. And uh, you know, depending on how conscientious your teacher was, she would or would not explain what it actually meant. And there's one other sort of small detail to that, is that Mayakovsky fathered a child during that visit. And that child became a professor, and uh, I never met her father, obviously, but was always aware of the fact that she had such a famous father. So this is just a little bit of the backdrop, which uh, really doesn't uh, matter a whole lot, except somehow it matters a little bit to Simon, and so it matters to me. Okay, and uh, this will take another maybe hour and 20 minutes, and then we can take questions. It's very, very short. So imagine, it's about a week into the stay at this resort in Borscht Belt, and uh, Simon is about to be very surprised. At breakfast the following morning, Madame Yankelson, red roses climbing the twin trellises of her chiffon top, came up to the table, said a perfunctory hello to the grandmothers, and turned her gaze onto Simon. Young man, I would like it very much if you could spend some time with me, she said like an ageless actress in a radio play. Please finish your breakfast and my friend Lydia and I will look forward to seeing you at our usual post near the column by the main entrance. A, to a Moscow tomcat, Simon may have been, but he was also a polite Jewish boy, and he couldn't very well say no or I'm busy. Half an hour later, he stood in front of Madame Yankelson like a cadet at graduation exercises. She raised herself from her chair, threaded her soft arm through his, and he thought of hot dogs and buns, of Rabelais' oversized lovers, and also of Marina, who would see him walking the same path, but in Madame Yankelson's company. Take me to the lake, darling, Madame Yankelson said, and led Simon across the meadow, I am leaving the parasol with you, she said to Lydia Schmuckler, who silently nodded. From her white rocking chair, Madame Yankelson picked up a sequent purse, the shape of a Maltese dog. As they walked across the front lawn in the direction of the lake, Madame Yankelson put more weight on his right arm, as though trying to shift the direction. I know a secluded spot. There's a little bench there and a marvelous view of the mountains, she said to Simon. Instead of following the main alley, they veered off to the left, walking on a narrower path, which then dropped, then corrected its course. They finally came to a clearing with a promised bench and ensnared shrubs behind its back, through an opening between tree trunks, one could see three bands of color, milky blue sky, pea green woods, and ink gray road, like a child's innocent painting uncluttered by people. I would like you to read some of your poems to me, said Madame Yankelson half turning to Simon and resting her bare arm on the back of the bench. My poems? Simon muttered, how do you know I write poems? I read, my young friend. I read emigre magazines, she replied. Well, perhaps another time, Madame Yankelson, he said, somehow unable to put things right. I will be your best audience, Madame Yankelson insisted. She took a thin brown cigarette out of her purse. I don't suppose you smoke, no. Well, you should know that I've been inspiring poets since I was a young lady. Holding the cigarette between her thumb and index finger, Madame Yankelson inhaled with effect. You don't believe me, she uttered with a labored laugh. No, I 
Mayakovsky himself was very fond of you, f fond of me, you know. Mayakovsky? Now Simon couldn't hide his curiosity. It, was, it wasn't very often that one ran into people who knew the great poet. To explain, I would have to tell you my age. And a true lady never reveals her age, said Madame Yankelson, making the kind of upward motion of her neck and cheekbones that was meant to pull back the furrows and wrinkles. Madame Yankelson, you are as young as you look, Simon said, horrified by the platitudes. He was prepared to spout. Thank you. You are becoming a very dear friend, she said, removing a perfumed handkerchief from her purse. She waved the handkerchief, letting its skein brush against her lips. We moved from Riga to Moscow in 1925. I was 13, Madame Yankelson said, beginning her story. My father was a renowned gemologist. He started working as an expert at the Central Jewelry Trust. So you're originally from Riga, Simon interrupted. You're a student of literature. You must have heard of my famous relative, Roman, said Madame Yankelson. Roman Yankelson is your relative, the great medievalist? My second cousin, same last name. Their branch is also from Riga, Madame Yankelson affirmed, her voice feigning indifference. Roman and I were a few years apart. When we emigrated, he was living in Boston, actually in Cambridge. I believe he had already retired. My late husband, too, was still alive, and we saw Roman in Manhattan when he was in town for a conference. I can't say he was dying to embrace his long lost relatives. Why not? Simon asked naively. He had himself baptized, you know. Non Jewish wife, non Jewish family, you know how it goes. A toadish frown crept onto Madame Yankelson's face, but she immediately chased it away with her white, fleshy hand. I said to him, <coughs> Romachka. Why do you need this nonsense? You want to write about Prince Igor? Be my guest. But you don't need to go to their church and convert to feel more Slavic. I don't think Roman or his Slovak wife liked hearing this. And he didn't even ask about the family that stayed behind in Riga. Still, Roma was my cousin. And when he passed on, I went down to Boston for his funeral. Madame Yankelson, Simon asked trying to steer the conversation back to Mayakovsky and poetry. You moved to Moscow from Riga. Oh, yes. In 1925, she picked up the dangling story. Moscow was terribly overcrowded. At first, we lived in an awful hole in the wall, even though my father was getting a very good salary and had connections. Finally, this was already 1926, my father managed to secure two rooms in a very decent apartment. Communal, of course, but that's the way it was back in those days. We moved to Gendrikov Lane, a very nice central location. You're from Moscow. You should know where it is. Vaguely, Simon said, isn't it somewhere near the Taganka Theater? Madame Yankelson sighed and dabbed off tiny beads of dew on her forehead. I was a girl but already a young woman, she continued. Now imagine, we're moving in, it's a hot sunny day in June, my father is at his office, my mother is running around and supervising the movers, and I'm just standing in everybody's way, wearing a lovely little sailor dress with ribbons and frills, taking everything in, and suddenly I see a big, handsome man with a shaved head, descending the stairs. At first I thought he was mean-spirited, but then he smiled at me. Not even a full smile, but a half smile and a flicker in his eyes, and I could tell he was a gentle soul. Hello, young lady, he said. Let's get acquainted. I'm Mayakovsky. I am Violeta Yankelson, I said. Are you by chance related to my good friend Ronka Yankelson? He asked me in such a way that I felt I could trust him completely. And may the Lord punish me if I'm lying to you. I felt that I would have done anything for this beautiful, sad man. Anything. 
So you lived in the same building as Mayakovsky, Simon asked, just to make sure he understood her correctly. The whole story was so fabulous. Yes, after 1926, and still after he shot himself. That was in 1930. I remember the day I found out like it was yesterday. They lived one floor above us, Mayakovsky and the Briggs. Lila was legally Briggs' wife, and Mayakovsky loved her madly. She ruined his life, you know that, don't you? What? was he like, Simon asked. Mayakovsky? A genius and such a gallant man. He was always so kind to us. My parents worshipped him. Madame Yankelson wiped the corners of her eyes with a thumb wrapped in the handkerchief. They sat for about a minute without speaking. All around them, on the clearing, grasshoppers stammered away. Dragonflies juddered in mid-flight. Bees pulverized the mountain air. The life. Dummy Uncleson wiped the corners of her eyes with a thumb wrapped in the handkerchief. They sat for about a minute without speaking. All around them, on the clearing, grasshoppers stammered away. Dragonflies juddered in mid flight. Bees pulverized the mountain air. The life of insects went about its hourly tasks, replete with small sounds and vibrations, and yet indifferent to the fluctuations of the human spirit. Madame Yankelson, should we head back? Back? She repeated, momentarily confused. But then, regaining clarity of mind, she lifted her body from the bench. Clutching her white purse with one hand, she leaned on Simon's elbow with the other. They walked on the path and quite innocently and thoughtlessly, just trying to find his way out of the encroaching silence, he said to Madame Yankelson, I'm ashamed to admit, but I've never been to Riga. We used to go to Piarno every summer. Suddenly, as if picking up a forgotten thread in the labyrinth of her past, she stopped looked at Simon with stern passion and cried out, I love Riga and I hate it. It's the place of my birth. It's a city of death. My parents had the foolishness to go to Riga in 1940 to visit my grandparents. My older brother was a young Air Force pilot stationed in the north. I was a recent university graduate. We didn't stop them and we were never to see them again, killed at Rumbola. Madame Yankelson and Simon parted in front of the main entrance, and he could see that her companion, Lydia Schmuckler, a silent sentinel, was waiting in her <laughs> chair. Simon waved to her, said a formal goodbye to Madame Yankelson, and ran up four flights of stairs to his garret. He collapsed and slept until lunch. And when he woke up, uh, as you can well imagine, things uh, became more and more disastrous. Uh, but you'll have to find out for yourselves. Thank you so much.